size of them, so more, so more cutting edge stuff I should be doing in the past uh, few months or few years. So um, thanks for being here. Thanks a lot. Yeah, with respect to here, I'm usually comfortable in our world and more like a vital thing, you know, the vital from the past. Individuals, and then you compare individuals with disease, without disease, similar uh, things apply to quantitative phenotypes. And then you try to find loci where uh, you have a situation that, for example, here controls have a uh, uh, bigger representation of the C allele compared to the T allele. And when, you, when this is done in, in hundreds and thousands of, of uh, diseases, different phenotypes, uh, in a statistically very rigorous way, we get these kinds of massive catalogs of, of uh, genetic variants that associate to disease. But the problem uh, with these um, studies is that uh, maybe some, some 15 years ago, there were high hopes that, that these kinds of approaches might lead to uh, us being able to actually predict uh, what is the disease risk of an individual, that, that we could analyze someone's genome and tell that, okay, you really need to watch out your, your uh, cholesterol levels or like you might, you might have a higher risk for diabetes, but this doesn't actually work. These are really weak associations with no predictive power at the individual level. But um, that's not like, it's, it's not all bad news. Um, we can still use this data very efficiently to understand uh, the biology of these different diseases. So the idea is that, that we have these catalogs, uh, same actually applies to some uh, Mendelian diseases, where we know that some genetic variants associate to high-level phenotypes such as disease. And if we can figure out what happens here in between, that can really give us a lot of information about the biology of the disease. What are the causal uh, biological mechanisms that when they are perturbed, they somehow lead to increased uh, disease risk? And one of the main approaches uh, to do this has been to uh, study cellular phenotypes, such as the transcriptome, uh, the, the kind of total pool of RNAs in, in human cells. So the, the, the idea being that if we can understand how genetic variants affect cellular phenotypes, that, that uh, helps us to kind of bridge the gap uh, to high-level phenotypes and, and really learn about the biology of the disease, which is essentially we want to develop interventions, new drugs, other, other kinds of treatments uh, to disease. And um, why this is one of the reasons why this, this kind of mapping, mapping uh, genetic variants that uh, affect the transcriptome has been so, so important is that um, w we have come to realize that the vast majority of uh, genome-wide association study signals actually come from non-coding regulatory regions. So it's not like you have, you have a major signal of, of non-synonymous coding variants. Uh, underlying these associations. A lot of it is, is regulatory, just basically telling us that regulatory variation in, in uh, humans and genetic regulatory variation is really, really a key component to understanding uh, disease uh, risk. And then there's also another very core question in, in genomics, not only human genomics, but, but genomics in general, just like how does the, the blueprint of the genome sequence produce a functional cell and a functional organism? And th this is a question that has been uh, analyzed by a number of large epigenetics consortium trying to understand the regulatory 
uh, mechanisms of the genome in, in, in general. But um, the challenge is that most of these studies are, are kind of like studying uh, one or a few genomes and, and then kind of linking that to, to uh, different kinds of uh, uh, functional effects. Uh, but, but in reality, what we have is, is, is not just a single human genome like the archetype of a genome. We really have multiple genomes. They are all a little bit different, and that's, those differences somehow lead to um, phenotypic differences in humans. And we can't really ignore, uh, ignore that. So, uh, so when we think about functional variation in in the human genome, so, so genetic variants that have some kind of an impact in function at the cellular or higher levels. Um, probably the most typical way to classify this is to think about coding and non-coding variation. But uh, I would actually say that, uh, that uh, um, that's kind of just think thinking about the locus of where variant is sitting is not very, very helpful in, in most cases. You would want to kind of like think that what does this variant do? And one way to, to classify them would be to think about vari variation that affects protein structure. So changes something in the amino acid uh, sequence or, or other, other types of modifications in structure. And then there is uh, 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 variants that affect gene regulation. And how the, the most typical way to kind of think about, yeah, so, so this, is, this is the kind of thing that I am most interested about, although I do some work on, on, on this side as well. So obviously the kind of ways to link, link these two kinds of classifications, uh, there are the obvious links of like non-synonymous variants affecting uh, protein structure, the, the amino acid sequence, that's, that's clear, and then non-coding variation can affect uh, gene regulation via epigenetic changes in chromatin structure, transcription factor binding, uh, non-coding RNAs, that kind of affects. But then also coding variation can affect gene regulation. Some of these like uh, uh, regulatory elements are actually in coding regions. There are effects on mRNA stability that can lead to, for example, synonymous changes leading to changes in, in how um, RNA is degraded, and then non-coding variation via, for example, splicing mechanisms can affect protein structure. So it's, it's a pretty complex landscape, and, and um, eventually we would want to understand all of this. And um, one important kind of a distinction that I want to make is that um, probably the most common approach of, uh, or, or the most common application of RNA sequencing analysis is to, is to uh, look at differential expression, for example, between cases and controls, or one tissue or another tissue, or a treatment or a no treatment. And what you typically get out of these studies is that you have some hundreds or even thousands of genes that have statistically significant differential expression. But what does that actually mean? Uh, a lot of these things um, uh, can be kind of causal to, for example, the disease, but uh, probably the majority of, of such, such uh, differences are just an effect of the condition that you're studying. And that can be interesting, but, but in, in my opinion, uh, many differential expression studies in, in, in itself, they don't actually give us a lot of information about what's going on in the biological reality. There's a lot of uh, kind of downstream work that is needed to, to, to gain some real understanding of such uh, studies. I'm not saying that it's, that it's not valuable, but it's just that like, there is this major problem of, of cause and, and effect. Whereas um, if we are studying how genetic variants affect the transcriptome, there are some major, major uh, advantages. So, so, um, as, uh, so um, when we think about how, how we can use uh, this data to understand kind of the regulatory mechanisms, regulatory networks in the cell, a typical situation might be that we have constructed a, a co-expression uh, network of genes. So we have two genes that have very correlated uh, expression, but from, from um, expression data alone, we can't really tell if it's like gene one regulating gene two or the other way around, or maybe the, there's a third factor uh, regulating both of them, and like what, what, what does this correlation actually mean? But if we can map uh, genetic variants, this actually gives us the kind of a causality anchor, because genetic variants, at least if you believe in Darwin and not Lamarck, they are not affected by anyone. So whenever you are studying something that is a phenotype, gene expression, methylation, 
whatever, like a higher level phenotype, they can always be causes and effects of different things, but genetic variants, they are the causes. And, and so, so in, in, in such a manner, we can, we can really use uh, um, uh, genetic variation to understand uh, genome function in, in a pretty efficient way, in addition to uh, understanding biological mechanisms underlying disease associations. And then one thing that I'm, I'm interested in, having, having a background in population genetics, is just kind of understanding the general spectrum of, of functional genetic variation. So now we know about 60 million um, genetic variants in human populations, and there are, of course, more, more samples you sequence, the more you find. And just kind of understanding how many of these are functional at different levels, affecting some cellular functions, other functions, it's, it's interesting just from a basic biology, evolutionary uh, perspective. So, so that's the kind of like uh, sort of big questions of why we would want to be uh, studying genetic effects on, on gene expression and, and cellular phenotypes in, in general. So, so next I'm going to be talking a little bit more about how do we actually uh, do this analysis. So, so um, the most basic kind of a study design is that we get, we get a, a, a population sample uh, of, of individuals uh, uh, samples. So, so it, typically we would need at least 50 individuals to be able to do kind of anything, but a couple of hundred is better, and of course the, the, the bigger the better, but, but it's, it's not like we don't need tens of thousands of, of individuals like uh, many GWAS studies. We can cope with relatively, relatively uh, modest amounts. And then we need to get uh, information about uh, the DNA, the genome, and then uh, about RNA. The, the same approach is also applied to other types of cellular phenotypes, such as methylation levels or chromatin activity or, or other things. But I'll be focusing on the RNA side uh, here because that's, that's what I work on as well, and it's kind of conceptually a little bit simpler. And then uh, nowadays we use, typically use sequencing to get get, I mean, to basically uh, analyze these, these samples, RNA-seq and then genome or exome sequencing. And we get out of it genotypes, uh, different measures of transcriptome phenotypes, such as gene expression levels or, or splicing or, or such things. And then we combine these two. So I'll, I'll explain these, these things more, what are, what are expression quantity loci and how we can look at allele-specific expression. But the idea is to basically get two data types and, and put them together. Yeah. Yeah, so in, in the majority of the studies that I have been doing, it's the, the individuals are, are kind of like some kind of a sample of a normal population. So my focus has been to kind of, kind of figure out the baseline of how these things vary uh, without any major disease component. We can still apply this information to disease, but, but people have been doing this also using different types of disease cohorts, et, et cetera. It, it, it depends on the, on the question. And then also um, some studies are, are are based on just um, like, for example, cell line samples collected from different individuals where you really have only like a single cell type, but, but uh, some studies, uh, and this is actually um, very much like a, the, the next step that people are thinking about now is like really getting information from, or, or like samples from different tissues so that you're able to analyze the, the tissue dimension. So, so of course, it's kind of like, DNA is DNA. I mean, an individual's genome is more or less an individual's genome, but the RNA side is, is much more complex. Like, you can, you can uh, study different tissues and, and also different conditions. Yeah. Uh, so you mean that if I, if I just compare the genome of two individuals, uh, what would be the number? Um, uh, yeah. Hmm? No, no, it's less. It's less. There are about 10 million SNPs that are common in Europeans. So that, to, or, or like any, any, like if you take a single continental group, maybe Africans are a little bit different story, but like let's say that uh, we study um, 500 uh, or 1,000 Europeans, you have about 10 million variants that are, that are, um, 
that are present in more than 5% of the individuals. I would say that it's probably in the order of tens of thousands. Two individuals, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, so it would be just like, like I mean, private, private variants would be included if it's just kind of like your genome versus my genome and, and how many differences you, you have. I mean, it's not that much because like the, 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 these kinds of like numbers of like 40 or 60 million variants that are known in human populations, most of these are, met, are seen in only one individual. So if you take just like two individuals at random, most of the individuals will be completely like preference in these these positions that carry rare variants uh, in some individuals. And um, one thing that I want to mention mention is that when we when we kind of like collect these data sets and do the RNA sequencing, there is of course very very heavy kind of quality control. Uh, uh, needed to be able to to like analyze biology and uh, all kinds of technical biases that that uh, you have in your data. So I'm not going to kind of like spend a lot of time going through uh, QC steps in these kinds of large scale RNA sequencing data sets. This is this is uh, kind of a companion paper, the Nature paper that we published uh, last fall about uh, at least some 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 measures of of how to how to uh, understand and correct for technical variation, but, but that, that is important. And, and in all of these large projects that I've been part of, we have put a lot of effort into, into this and also kind of trying to publish the papers and, and put the guidelines and best practices out there for the community to, to um, see and, and review. But to, but to talk about the kind of the actually more interesting analysis, um, the most classical way to, to uh, link um, uh, genetic variation and, and gene expression levels is to analyze expression quantitative trait loci, or, or EQTLs, as we call them uh, uh, shortly. And this is it's kind of like, sounds like a fancy and, and complicated term, but it, it just simply means um, variants that affect gene expression or that correlate to gene expression in a population sample. So, so, so the way it works is that we, we um, uh, take SNPs and look at the genotypes of the different SNPs, split our population sample according to the genotype of, of, of that variant, and then see if this uh, uh, genotype correlates with gene expression levels of, of, of a particular gene. So we do this kind of like in a pairwise manner kind of all SNPs versus all genes, or we can select some subsets of that data. But the idea is just simply like SNP to gene correlation. So this is kind of a, it's just an association study. Yeah. So, 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 so that's, that's the beauty of, the, of EQTL analysis, that we can look at all against all if we want to. Like we can basically take like we, we take one gene at a time, and we can look at all the SNPs in the genome and, and, and their association to the expression level of this one gene. It gets statistically a little bit tricky to, to uh, get, get kind of, to assess the significance and everything, but like conceptually, that's, that's how we, we can do it, that we don't need to predefine that this is a SNP that I want to analyze. It's kind of like, it's, it's basically a gene, it's, it's, it's like a genome-wide association study uh, done on uh, like uh, 10,000 10, phenotypes that are the, the expression levels of all the individual genes. Yeah, yeah, it could be, but but like in 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 the in the most typical study design, we don't know that, and and probably then you might need to control that in some ways because then yeah, like. Yeah, that might cause some bias as well. Yeah. Can you account for cell heterogeneity in the tissues and patch Yeah, great, great question. So, so some of the studies that we have done have been done in cell lines that are obviously a pure, pure cell type, and and then we would expect to see less of that kind of variation. But for example, in whole blood studies or any kind of tissue piece that you take, it obviously has multiple different uh, cell types. 
And there are some like statistical methods that you can use to kind of basically deconvolute the, the proportions of different cell types, which you can then kind of use kind of like correct way that kind of variation from from your data. Or for um, for example, Avi Regev's group has been doing a lot of work in kind of um, just if you take a blood sample, you just sort sort the cells and so that you can get specific uh, cell populations. But but that is definitely a, a challenge here. Um, so it, 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 it depends on the study. So in, in most of my own work, we have been using cell line samples where it's not a, not a problem. And, and also when people have been using tissue samples, uh, people typically don't take that into account that much. It might increase your power and like lead to some advantages if you, if you do, but it's, I mean, this is also a very new field, so people haven't done this that, that much at, at the moment. And in general, like, um, it, in, in most of the cases, it should only increase your variance, so, so that you have more technical variance in the measurements of gene expression levels because you have these mixtures of different cell types, but it's not that common that you would get false associations because of that. That would only happen if you have a situation that, uh, that the genotype affects the proportions of different cell types in a, in a given tissue sample, for example. So, so we know a few cases in whole blood where, where this actually happens, that there are some SNPs that kind of increase the, the proportion of a particular cell type, and then you might get a false association, but this, this, is, a, this is a minority. Um, where do, okay, let's start from, from there. I think you were first. <laughs> So, like, if you have less than 50, you shouldn't even try. And, and above 50, like, with, with, like, 50 to 100, you can do it and you'll find some stuff, but your power is quite low. And then kind of above 100 or above 150 or so, then you start to have uh, decent, decent power. You find, actually, thousands of significant signals. Okay, next. Yeah. Um, would it change if you, uh, if you, if you, let's say you're only interested in bunch of rough studies, or you're only interested in cystic QTLs that might be around 50 loci, let's say, would your analysis be more powerful with your QTL analysis, or does it really not so much? Um, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a tricky question. I mean, it's, it's a similar thing as like, if you do GWAS, you require any single association to have a very significant like 10 to the minus 8 uh, type of a p-value. If you do a candidate gene analysis, it's less enough. I mean, it's still, I mean, my, my kind of personal view tends to be that, that, that you should use the kind of genome-wide cutoffs even if you are doing something more targeted, unless you have some kind of like an extremely strong uh, biological hypothesis and prior why you would allow a, a less stringent threshold, but this is a matter of debate. Some people might disagree with me. Yeah, so the first question, uh, somatic variants. So typically the, 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 the genome data that we have is like from a blood sample or something that is like we don't really have, have information what might be germline and somatic. And of course, if you just do like standard SNP calling, you typically don't really get the somatic variants. But there, there are some efforts to try to study that. But I think that in general, the vast majority of these kinds of effects will be driven by germline, germline variants. Uh, interesting to see what the contribution is of like background germline yeah. background, and then you add on top of that variants yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, at the moment, no one knows. <laughs> 
Uh, for age, um, it depends. So many, many studies use age as a covariate, so they kind of break the weight they affect. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's quite often done. And, so, and people have also been looking at kind of age-specific EQTLs or, or maybe like genetic variants that change their function when a person ages. You had a question? Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that, I think, in the next slide. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, so what is done in most studies, um, still at the moment, many of them are based on the SNP genotyping arrays that are then imputed with 1,000 genomes or, or have map, and then, then that data is used in this analysis. And, and even if we have uh, genome sequencing data, or kind of like, I mean, the imputation step is kind of like one, one way how we use these, these data sets. But, but um, as you can see here, as I say, that it's, this, is, this approach works only for common variants. So you can imagine that if you have an extremely rare SNP and you, that is represented by only one individual here, you have absolutely no statistical power to say that this is a significant association. So people use um, uh, frequency cutoffs of like 5% or 1%, but this is typically, so this, this should be based on your study sample rather than 1,000 genomes or have map because what, what, so, so we do that frequency filtering because of the power issue. And if you, for some reason, uh, you're, if you're confident about your genotyping quality and everything, and you happen to have in your population a SNP that is, let's say, 10%, and it's 1% in, in, in have map, like you will still have power to call this association in your particular study. Um, it does increase your power. Like there are some some things that that you would miss without imputation. But in general, like a SNP a SNP arrays, the modern ones, they capture common variation quite well. Um, yeah, so, so there is a very strong uh, frequency bias there, so, so it becomes... <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so as you may know, that like if, if we just take, like for example, all the variants in 1,000 genomes, the frequency spectrum is like this, of, of genetic variants. But in EQTL studies, we get something like this because the closer the variant is to like 50% frequency, the higher your statistical power is, is to call it, so that basically you have more individuals kind of spread throughout the different genotypes, and, and that's why it's much easier for you to find, find association. So there is, there is a very strong bias, bias in terms of the frequency, which is very important to take into account in some analysis, especially if you're trying to do population genetics of of uh, regulatory variants, which is something that I have been doing. It's, it's, it's a big bias to, to a comfort. Does, um, does your uh, algorithm, do your algorithm, yeah. Yeah, so usually not. I mean, usually we don't have these kinds of data from the samples that, that we have, like when did you collect the sample or like what the person had for breakfast or something. It's, it's typically just like that it's not there because these are population scale samples. It's often difficult to kind of do this sort of like very, very careful sampling. And also we are looking at uh, like not just kind of generally characterizing the transcriptome, looking at, at differential gene expression or something, we are looking at genetic effects on gene expression. And that's uh, like, you could probably imagine that there might be some genetic variants that are kind of active in the morning, but not in the evening, but it's not like no. super likely. <laughs> So, I mean, there, there are outliers in the gene expression data for sure, and that's important to take into account in the analysis that you do. But in general, like these kinds of like experimental sampling variation, like whether it's circadian rhythm or, 
or um, cell type heterogeneity, it will most often just increase the variation here in gene expression levels, which kind of can reduce your statistical power a little bit, but, but rarely kind of really affect the, the signal that you're looking for. It's, it, it ranges a lot. So, so there are some variants where like, uh, like the, the heritability explained by the genetic variant can be up to like 80% or something that it's really like the, the, the expression level of the gene can really be almost like determined by a SNP. But then of course, like now we have some, some studies where we have like really big sample sizes and then you're able to find more and more subtle effects. So, so they can be very strong, like much stronger than for example, any G was Locus that is known, but yeah, most of them have most of them have small effects. Was there any Yeah, yeah, there are some differences. This is not like terribly well studied. Um, there's a bunch of problems there, um, sort of like technical biases, but. But in general, the idea is that like, we are able to capture common genetic variants with this approach. And if you have some genes where the regulation is extremely tightly controlled, and any variant changing this would be deleterious, then you don't have any EQTLs you don't have any common variants affecting the expression levels. And I think there's, there is definitely some indication that this is happening. There's like, yeah, pH, for example, is it kind of So um, cis EQTLs or like proximal local uh, EQTLs are such where where the SNP is very close to the gene that it's um, uh, affecting, and this is this is uh, like typically driven by elements such as like transcription factor binding in enhancers, etc., that are kind of like regulating the gene in in the same locus, and these are kind of allelic effects in the sense that like like you have like these two alleles, so this would be a heterozygous individual for an EQTL here, and then some like this chromatin like structure landscape uh, the function of it is different than than for the other other haplotype that the individual is carrying. But then there are also these uh, distal effects that uh, trans EQTLs that can be mediated by all kinds of, for example, transcriptor factor effects or something that they change something in the cell that has some downstream consequences. So for example, here you would have, uh, for example, let's say that this is a transcription factor gene that has a non-synonymous variant that changes somehow the function of, of the transcription factor. And then you would have, so this would be like two different individuals, sorry, that's not terribly clear, but, but basically individuals carrying the T allele would have like more of the functional transcriptor factor that, that would then lead to an EQTL signal in the, in the downstream uh, gene. So you would find an EQTL between this variant here and a, and a gene completely elsewhere in, in the genome. Yeah, 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 exactly. And um, uh, so as, as I said before, like with modern uh, computational tools, uh, we are able to do kind of full EQTL analysis of basically all variants against all genes. So this would be in practice, so in a typical sample you would quantify about 12,000 genes, then you might have something like 7 or 10 million variants, so this would be like um, 84 billion tests, but this, this, is, this is absolutely doable. Like with the scripts that, that we have with the tools, a little bit of parallelization is like 30 minutes and it's done. Um, but of course, this is a huge number of tests and it's very difficult to get statistically significant signals once you create for multiple testing when you, when you have uh, these this many tests. So, so what people are trying to do, like, like what, what you need this kind of a all versus all test for is for finding the trans EQTLs that can be basically anywhere in the genome. 
and, and because of the multiple testing problem, people have been kind of developing different approaches to do more sort of sophisticated trans analysis. So instead of all versus all, you choose some subset of the data, for example, look only at transcription factors or use some network priors or something. But that's still uh, kind of in development. There are, there are no gold standards in, in that. And the problem is that in this kind of like um, uh, trans analysis, all, all versus all analysis, or, or this kind of comp very comprehensive searches, you do need larger sample sizes. So if you have like less than 500 individuals, you shouldn't even, even try. You, you're not going to find anything. Yeah. Um, so so there, are, there, are, there are a number of papers discussing this and different approaches to that. So, so there are like many things that one could try, but there is no kind of like established, this is the thing that we are all using and this is the one that works best. Um, so the more, the more common type of analysis that I have been doing in most of my, my studies is, is just to focus on cis eqtl so the proximal ones. So, so in, in, in that kind of a study, we take uh, all the genes that are expressed in our sample, and then we look at uh, most typically one megabase window at, around the transcription start site of, of that gene. That is basically the, the, the cis regulatory um, um, region of, of all the genes. It should include most of the enhancers. Yeah, so it's, it's not completely arbitrary, surprisingly <laughs> enough. <laughs> it sounds like that, but, but there is actually some experimental data that, that the farthest enhancers for a gene, except for some like extreme outliers, are supposed to be about one megabase away. So, so the vast majority of the things that we find are actually very close to the gene, like 100 kb or something, but, but if, my opinion is that you should go a little bit go a little bit further and, and one megabase should include pretty much uh, the regulatory elements. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, that's, that's definitely a problem, but it's not like with m one megabase window, we're still like extremely far from the, from the kind of 84 billion tests. So, and so, and, and I, I kind of believe that, like, if, if you take a very narrow window, then it becomes almost this kind of like a candidate approach, that you, you only find the things that you expect to find. Whereas one MB, at least there is like some uh, additional biological data indicating that, that this is likely to include the local uh, regulatory region of, of all the genes, so that you're basically, you can find whatever is there. So, so some people use a smaller window, but that means that they are excluding distal enhancers. So that if there are some interesting, important effects from distal enhancers, they're not going to see it. And I think that's a problem. So would you be doing then analysis of only, li like that you pick a single gene and you take the 1 MB window, or? A 1 MB window, but not necessarily around the gene. Um, yeah, well, I mean, then the, the chances are that you're not going to find anything, because most of, the, I mean, well, actually, a, a pretty big proportion of the genome is within 1 MB of, of a gene, but, but still, like, I think that that will be kind of like a random select. So, so, so like this, this is based on a biological prior, or a kind of like some biological understanding of where we think that that these effects might be. Like kind of trying to be comprehensive when it comes to analyzing cis effects, um, but but kind of yeah, focusing on on something. I think that just picking a one MB region somewhere would like you might find some find something, but what would it mean? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but then it's kind of like so you found this one effect there, but what, like, but you didn't test for everything, so it, it's not necessarily the most important. Or um, yeah. Yeah. 
you, you miss a lot. So I don't have an exact number for this, especially for trans effects, but, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of get back to this later. But, but most of the EQTLs, even in CIS that we have identified, don't overlap any kind of annotations that we currently know. There's a lot of things there that are just not known. <laughs> Uh, that's part of the explanation, but unlikely the full explanation. This probably accounts only for a pretty small, small kind of area in that. I'll, I'll talk about that more as well. Do you think the tertiary structure of the context might actually be the You mean kind of like enhancer type of, or, or kind of like the 3D structure? Yeah, yeah. So, so there might be, and there is starting to be some indication that you would have these kind of like, like cis effects that are really like super far. Like it's on the same chromosome, but it's still, still far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I think that there is, there is actually pretty heavy hopes that like, kind of getting enough of samples to do proper trans analysis and being able to find, find some of these effects. And, and some of the kind of distal enhancer effects make sense when you look at, at uh, some high C type of data. Yeah. Yeah. So um, my, my kind of, I, I don't think anyone has any, any kind of like a good and solid answer to this. So, so I'm, I'm just kind of like speculating here, but but um, my feeling is that it's like it's just the nature of kind of regulatory networks that whoops um, that when you have these kinds of things that are mediated by something else, they are indirect. You kind of like enter this space where you have all kinds of buffering mechanisms between things, and the cells are very good at buffering all kinds of changes. And then also you you would have like kind of. Uh, different kinds of uh, biological and technical artifacts that can kind of like perturb those those networks, like what's going on there. So you basically have just increased variance uh, from a multiple different factors. It's basically like a more complex model. The more more players you have there, the the smaller the the um, effects are. Um, it depends on what you're interested in. Um, I am a geneticist by background, so I'm more interested in the SNPs. <laughs> but but at, at, I think that if you're analyzing, for example, regulation of a particular gene or what its role is in, in genetic networks, it might be very relevant information to know that there is actually a genetic variant that affects it. Yeah. 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 So, well, ac that's actually on the next slide. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, um, we can um, obviously measure many kinds of different things from RNA sequencing data. So, it's not, I mean, I've been talking about like gene expression levels, but that's only the kind of like the most simplistic type of a thing that we can measure. And we know very well that it's not really the biological reality. It's, it's really like transcripts that the genes are producing and expressing. And that's, that's the biological reality there. The problem with doing um, EQTL analysis with transcript quantifications is that they are very difficult to measure from short read RNA sequencing data. So quantifying them, there is a big debate about what are the best algorithms and how well they work. And, and in our experience, none of them work really well. So that's kind of like a technical challenge, which is the reason why still a lot of things are done either at the gene level or at the exon level, which is kind of like taking the problem to smaller uh, pieces. But that's, whoops, there's a little bit of missing here. But so this is basically the things that you would use to find EQTL, so expression quantitative trait loci. But then there's, of course, the component of splicing. And we can use like different kinds of metrics to to uh, quantify splicing in, in a similar manner as we quantify expression line and, and then look, use that for a splicing QTL analysis. So look for SNPs that correlate these different, different types of metrics of uh, splicing. And then 
Uh, depending on how you have produced your RNA sequencing data, you can also look at a, a lot of other things. So, so for example, in one of these studies, we had uh, small RNA sequencing data, so we looked at QTLs from microRNA levels. Uh, many link RNAs you get even from poly-A RNA-seq data. There are all kinds of things like expression of annotated, re un -annotated regions, RNA editing, like kind of uh, <laughs> uh, your Im imagination and technical skills are the limit of like basically trying to measure and quantify biologically interesting uh, traits from, from RNA sequencing data. And then if you're able to do that, uh, you can look for, for QTLs for them, which will be interesting for understanding what kind of things uh, genetic variants can, can affect. And once you have quantified those, those uh, things, kind of like other the raw quantifications, it's very important to normalize these data, data uh, properly. So in eQTL studies, the nice thing is that, that the analysis that we're really doing is kind of like taking a quantification of, let's say, a gene or an exon and, we, and comparing that across different individuals. And this is in many ways an easier problem than trying to compare expression levels of, for example, one gene and another gene and trying to say which is higher, which is lower. Because there are things like uh, sequence context and the length of the element, etc., that are the same between different individuals, at least in, in most cases. And so, so that basically makes the normalization challenge a little bit easier and kind of um, some, some, of the, some of the normalization battles that are going on in the differential expression world don't really apply to the EQTL uh, uh, world. But, but doing this re, uh, uh, really improves your, your statistical power to find uh, uh, QTLs. There are various published methods for, for doing this, and it's, it's a relatively established field when it comes to cis-EQTL analysis. But trans-EQTLs are more complicated because they're like the actual biological effect that you're looking for it, can be a very global change in gene expression patterns. And some of these normalization methods will kind of happily correct that out as a, as a likely technical artifact, which means that you can actually lose the things that you're trying to find. But this is, this is an area of, of development. There are some, some approaches that probably work somehow. And, and um, if you think about the, just the, the general distribution of if you take, a, take an, uh, like 100 individuals and measure expression levels of a gene in these individuals, the distribution tends to be relatively normal. But in rna seq data, there are always outliers, and this has to be dealt with. Otherwise, that can lead to uh, false um, association signals. And then when you have, you have quantified your um, gene or whatever transcriptome phenotype, you have normalized it, then it's time to look, look uh, for the association. So, so it's, uh, um, mostly, uh, mostly it's a pretty, pretty uh, simple thing to do. So, so what people use most of the time is just linear regression. So, so expression and then genotype and whatever covariates you might want to include from your normalization, etc. And, and there are some uh, extremely efficient software tools for, for doing this analysis that, that, I mean, we're doing a huge number of tests, but it's, it's really doable and not, not, that, uh, not that difficult, really. And then there are some, uh, are actually, there are lots of more sophisticated models for doing EQTL analysis that try to improve power, etc. But these are mostly used in more specific purposes, that if there is some kind of, you're looking for an interaction between SNPs or you're looking at want to quantify tissue specificity or something, then there might be something more that you would want to do than, than just this. Yeah. Yeah, so especially for cis EQTL analysis, uh, the additive model actually makes biological sense because like these are supposed to be kind of like haplotypic things that, that if you have a heterozygous individual, it has like one chromosome basically working in a slightly different way than the other. And yeah, what, what do you mean by limit? Um, yeah, I mean, could, could be, but that hasn't really been observed. So in the, in the early stages of when people started to do EQHL analysis, there was a no number of papers investigating whether these are additive effects or something else, and the vast majority seems to be additive. 
but in in trans it's it's a it's an open question no one really knows <laughs> And, and then, like, once we have kind of run the, the simple model and gotten some p-values and effect sizes out of it, then there's the, there's the big question of, like, what is actually significant. And the gold standard way to determine this is doing permutations so that you, you like, for each of the genes that you have studied, you randomize, you randomize the expression data, the expression levels, permute the phenotype, and then recalculate the test and you repeat this uh, thousands, tens of thousands of, of times. And this, this is the step that is computationally very demanding. So, so that's, that's the kind of like, with some simple linear regression models, it, it actually works, but, but that's kind of like a challenge of, of making permutations work. And like without permutations, there are, there are methods that you can use to, to estimate FDR, but it gets kind of tricky. And like, at, at least I want to always do some permutations just to be sure. And, and then you use those permutations to estimate like how, how often would you find an association signal at, 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 at least as significant as what you observed in, in your real, real data and use this to, to uh, set an FDR false discovery rate threshold. Um, well, so some, some people have done this, but, but I, I tend to think that since it is possible to do kind of a more comprehensive analysis, limiting yourself to some subset might be like, I mean, maybe there might be some small effects in, even in the less variable genes that you would not find. And it's kind of like um, the same applies to what, like when you, when you measure these genes, like you, you need to define what you, what, what are the genes that you, you take as expressed? Like if you have something that is expressed at extremely low levels, that there is probably like nothing, nothing there that you could detect. But, but in general, I think it's better to be inclusive so that you don't have arbitrary thresholds. It's, it's better to do kind of like some additional tests and lose a little bit of statistical power because of that than have some kind of a cutoff of, there might be something here, but I didn't look. That's my personal opinion at least. Yeah. Is there a, a rationale for uh, doing dimensional dimension reproduction first using <coughs> and then um, you know, trying to predict? Um, yeah, yeah. One that yeah, yeah, one could do that, and people have been kind of doing, developing some methods for, for that, that as well. Um, it, it does, it does uh, to some degree. Then of course, like it's sort of any complication that you add makes it a little bit more difficult to interpret what you get out of it. So that's the sort of like, depends a little bit on the question that you're asking that if, if you want to just kind of like basically map whatever regulatory variance, then doing the simple thing might be enough if you want to kind of understand perturbation of genetic networks, then maybe the network analysis makes more sense. Um, there is oops, previous one. So, so this is actually an, in, in, an important slide. So, so when we do this analysis, the, how do we interpret the data that we get out of it? So now we have our, our set of uh, significant um, EQTLs above, uh, let's say, 5% false discovery rate. And what we find in all studies is that we find a lot of things. So regulatory variation in, in cis is extremely common. In, in trans, it's a little bit more like an unknown question. But, but in cis, we find typically thousands of genes that have a significant uh, common variant associating, associating to its uh, expression levels. And once we kind of like start looking at uh, more d tissues and larger sample sizes, we're going to end up in a situation where every single gene has some kind of a, a significant association. And as we kind of like talked about before, these, these association landscapes tend to be pretty complex. So here I'm, I'm showing an example of, of uh, what an association landscape of one gene looks like. So here in the middle, you would, you would have the transcription start side, and I think the gene body was then like kind of this way. And this is just, just the closest 100 uh, KB. But uh, I mean, obviously, because of linkage disequilibrium, it's not like you just get like one single functional variant giving you that nice association uh, signal. Uh, genetic variants are correlated to each other, uh, uh, usually. 
And, and this means that, that you kind of like, you get a ton of significant associations when even, even when there is probably only one single functionally uh, causal variant underlying there. So, so basically there's one variant that changes something in, let's say, uh, chromatin activity that ch leads to gene expression changes. And then in these statistical tests you find uh, a lot of them. In, in some ways it makes it easier to find these associating regions because you don't necessarily have to even have genotype data of the real functional variant. You can just use these proxies. But, but it makes, does make it very difficult to figure out from these what is the, the causal variant. And then, then, as you mentioned, there are also correlations between transcripts of the same gene and a change in genes. And this, this needs to be taken into account in the analysis in some ways. That, that uh, at least when it comes to if you have measured transcripts of the same gene and done QTL analysis for that, you can't really treat them as independent uh, uh, signals or independent uh, phenotypes. And I don't know, are, uh, how many are not familiar with linkages equilibrium? Okay, I'll, I'll try to give you a, a quick ex explanation. So let's think about two genetic variants that are pretty close to each other. And, and both of them have these two alleles, and like um, in, in, un, under the null, you would kind of expect to see 25% of each of these, these four different combinations of these two alleles. But what happens in, a, a lot in, in the human genome, also in other, other uh, populations, is that you actually observe only these two combinations. So, so A is always together with T, G is always together with C. And, and this, is, this is a very common, extremely widespread phenomenon, and that leads to, leads to uh, so basically, this, this signal here, this correlation between genetic variants. And it's, it's a very natural consequence of like how, how, like how the genetic variant has accumulated in, in all populations, in all genomes. So kind of like in the, in the if we think about like, let's say, 50,000 years back, there was this there were no SNPs here. There was only, only the A allele in this one, one uh, side and only the T allele here. Then there is a mutation that changes T to C. Okay, so now we have a situation where, where um, 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 like we have, we have two different haplotypes, we have another mutation changing this thing to G. And so now we end up with some kind of a situation where you have the T allele is always together with C, A allele is always, to, t sorry, the T allele is always together with A. And these kinds of things just uh, keep on going. And then sometimes you might lose some haplotypes just by chance. So basically it's kind of like a normal population genetic evolutionary process of how mutations accumulate in the same locus. They have to happen on one haplotypic background and that, that leads to these kinds of correlations. So, that, so then in the end you might end up in a situation where you have only these two things, uh, two haplotypes present. And what this means is that is that like you have perfect correlation, so what, whatever, like, whatever association signal you have for this variant, this will give you the exact same signal because they are they're, they're perfectly correlated. And this is the kind of a patterns that you see in the human genome, so these would be all the different genetic variants and, and, the, and the red color shows that the strength of correlation between them. So you have these very large blocks where things are perfectly correlated to each other. And what this means, as I said, is that if you have, let's say here, like one functional sleep actually that changes something in the genome that leads to a, uh, some, some kind of a phenotype, when you do an association study for a, for a, a disease or for, an, for a gene expression level, you find that all of these SNPs here will be also significantly associated. So you have to kind of deal with that fact, or it's, it's just like part of the nature of the data that we get from any kind of an association study. And I think I'm... Um, I mean, I, you probably could, like, if you have something like, something like this, I mean, you would know that these, like, there is some kind of a haplotype block here, and then a little bit less, like, here, but, uh, yeah, yeah. So I can imagine things like, you know, um, insulators, you know, that could kind of break, you know, the sort of expression signal, and therefore, this probably no, but that's that's different. So so um, and so so that would that would not uh, so so basically, genetic like like functional gene genetic elements uh, such as insulators or something 
they are separate from LD. So even if you if you have like like uh, like one signal driven by a very very specific uh, element and then an, an insulator somewhere there, you would still find the exact same haplotype structure. Yeah, so just, um, I'm, I'm almost done, we're not too late from lunch, but just to kind of like um, basically define in a slightly more explicit way what's the terminology when we talk about EQTLs. It's, it's used quite vaguely uh, by many people, but, but so EQTL is expression quantitative trait locus. It's a genetic locus, really. So it's, it's a region in the genome that has association to expression. Uh, levels, but so the, and and then uh, these EQTLs, these loci contain EQTL variants. Some people call them eSNPs, that are basically any significant variant in in these uh, EQTL regions. And then sometimes we call like the top variant or the best variant that is the one that is kind of like in the top of the p-value association landscape that has kind of like probably the, the most likely causal variant. But um, people use this in a slightly inconsistent way that people can say that a SNP is an EQTL. They mean that like, the, the, the SNP has a significant association, but, but in, in the strict sense, like, this, is, this is a larger thing than, than a SNP. And then EQTL gene or E gene is a gene that has a significant EQTL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what is significant is, of course, a matter of definition, but like, yeah, yeah. If you have something that is completely invariable, I don't know if that really happens biologically ever. Well, that, that yeah. like, like, but I mean, even, even very tiny things, you could have a very small genetic effect that like has, I don't know, changes gene expression by 1%, but if you have enough of statistical power to find it, you might find it. Like, of course, it's uh, genes that have strong EQTLs tend to have more variation. Like, if you just measure the variation of gene expression in a population, there is some correlation there. But some genes that have very little variation can still have a tiny bit of variation well explained by a genetic variant. And also, some genes are extremely variable, but we can't find any genetic effects. It could be environmental, like anything. Um, so, um, I think I, is there something that is really important here? So I always said that EQTLs are very common. Um, typically, if we measure EQTLs, at least in cis, between different populations, in, in, in different tissues, in di different sort of environmental conditions, the sharing of these signals tends to be quite high. That, that to be like in the cis space, it's sort of like the, the, the the signals are, are very consistent, kind of telling us that the functional mechanisms are often, often kind of like the same in, in different kinds of groupings. Uh, in, in trans EQTLs, it's, it's a different story as we discussed. So these are more sort of like smaller, context dependent, less shared effects, kind of like vague. And, and they probably explain a very large proportion of expression variance. There are some studies of that. But finding them, like really being able to pinpoint that this is a trans EQTL, is, is quite difficult. And then uh, about the functional mechanisms, so, so uh, uh, cis EQTLs tend to be very highly enriched close to transcription start size, so in the promoter uh, region. That's, that's where we find the strongest uh, signals by far. But then there are also like enhancer effects, more distant things uh, going on. And, and there is a high, highly significant overlap with different kinds of uh, fu functional annotations of like chromatin activity, transcription factor binding sites, uh, etc. also methylation. But, but there is also a, a ton of things that are unexplained by current uh, data, which is kind of telling us that the, un, the current epigenetic data is not very comprehensive. There are some functional elements there that we just haven't uh, identified. And then uh, the very last thing that I want to talk about is another approach to analyze uh, regulatory variation, and that is uh, allele-specific expression. 
uh, where we are looking at regulatory differences between two haplotypes of an individual. So here we do the basic analysis is done one individual at a time, and you can analyze like only one individual. You don't necessarily need to have a population. So, so here, this would be uh, a gene in one single individual, the two different haplotypes. And, this, uh, and, and the way this works is that if this individual is heterozygous for a, a coding variant, um, we can just take our RNA sequencing data that, that is mapped uh, in this gene and calculate how often do we observe each of these two alleles. The null expectation, of course, in a heterozygous individual is that you would find 50-50 ratio of these two alleles in RNA-seq data. But when this is not the case, that's what we call um, allele-specific expression or allelic imbalance. And, and that can be a, a very powerful approach in, in many ways. I've also developed an extension to this to look at allele-specific splicing so that you would look how these reads carrying the, the different, different uh, alleles are distributed across the exons of, of a gene. And this really allows us to characterize this regulatory variation even when we haven't identified the EQTL. So in the most common case, these kinds of signals would be driven by this individual being heterozygous for an EQTL or some regulatory variant. Uh, somewhere, but we don't have to know about that. We can just basically look at its effects. We can characterize the effects and quantify them and play around with them and look at how they are shared and everything um, uh, when we don't have the EQTLs. And that, that, that can happen when, if the regulatory variant is so rare that we haven't been able to map it with EQTLs, if we are studying a sample that is so small that we can't do EQTL analysis. So there, there's a bunch of approaches. I'll talk a little bit uh, more about this after, after lunch. Um, yeah, oh, I, I had the slide over here. So, so you can look at regulatory variation um, uh, using this approach. Then there are also things like loss of function variation, nonsense media decay that you can detect. I'll talk about that. Also imprinting, so other types of mechanisms that lead to um, allele-specific expression or monoallelic expression. There are also various types of uh, sort of technical biases in, in allelic <coughs> analysis. So, so there are some mapping biases, genotyping error that can lead to problems. So, so uh, mapping bias refers to the fact that if you're, if for example, in, in this case, the C allele is the reference allele, and you're mapping your rna seq data against the reference, you might, be, you might have a situation where the, the alternative allele, in this case, the T has a smaller likelihood to map correctly, and the, you have to deal with these kinds of biases. Then there is the question of like read coverage. So, so the typical statistical test that we do here, so we would have bigger numbers that, that we would test, but like you would just ask, is this, is the, are these read counts consistent with a 50-50 ratio or not? But um, if you have, if you are testing two, uh, four, four reads versus six reads, you have very little power to say anything 40 versus 60, 400 versus 600, you get uh, huge different statistical power and, and kind of dealing with that in, in analysis is, is challenging. And, and myself and others are kind of developing various methods to really integrate these data with EQTLs and other, other data types to get as much biology out of it as possible. Um, so to, to summarize a couple of the points that we were talking about, so regulatory variation is really widespread in the genome. It's not like your GWAS was where you kind of, uh, you're lucky to get a handful of, of uh, uh, significant variants. We get thousands of these things. And mapping, especially cis EQTLs, is not really that, that complicated. There are pretty good kind of gold standard methods for, for doing that. But then you need to be uh, careful about how you interpret the results because they are, they are everywhere. They're extremely widespread. You have a lot of linkage disequilibrium, different kinds of correlation structures that can be kind of confounding the signal that you're looking for if you're not careful. And then there is a lot of uh, development ongoing in the field to not just kind of collect more samples and get more interesting kind of uh, biological sample collections, but also to uh, develop statistical methods to better characterize and find trans EQTLs, allele specific effects, uh, cellular mechanisms, <laughs> and, and uh, look into not just kind of protein coding genes, but, but to like look at more diverse uh, uh, cellular phenotypes that we, that we can get from these data. 
and then also to uh, understand the kind of downstream things about how these things actually affect human, human uh, phenotypes. There's a lot of data about overlap of EQTL signals and GWAS signals and, and how they can kind of, how these things can explain some of those things and help to bridge the gap from genotype to high level phenotype. But, but um, it's, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And one thing that I'm always saying that like, I, see, I see a lot of this kind of mentality in the human genomics community that everyone is just like sequencing exomes because exomes are easy and we can interpret that and we have some kind of a code like what to do with all these variants. And like, yeah, no, whole genome is getting, it's getting pretty cheap, but I don't want to do it because what do I do with the data? And no one can interpret those non-coding variants. And like, but if we don't get the data, we're never going to learn. And we ha actually have... Uh, catalogs of thousands of these likely functional variants and and we can do uh, analyses like RNA sequencing to be able to map these even further and really characterize the effects of of non-coding and, and regulatory variants and we're we're not quite quite there yet that we will be able to like take non-coding variants and based on its properties uh, predict if it affects, for example, gene expression or something, but we're not too far from that. I would say that probably in, in the next couple of years we're starting to get there. And then, uh, yeah, just an, an, um, I'll, I'll save the kind of big acknowledgements for the, for the uh, second talk, but, but this is just to kind of like advertise uh, my affiliations at, at the Genome Center and at Columbia. Thanks. Thanks.